Father, as we turn our uh, thoughts, Lord, towards, uh, towards your word, we certainly want to continue to pray for the families that have lost uh, loved ones this week and pray uh, in particular for the uh, Nishizuka family here in Kailua that uh, lost their son. And uh, we know there's a lot of crossovers in the, in the communities uh, of aviation, and we know guys that know them and, uh, and, uh, and certainly grieve along with them and ask you to bring comfort to them. And Lord, we don't know where they're at knowing you. We pray that they know you, and if not, we pray you would bring someone into their lives that would be able to uh, bring the message of Jesus Christ and the message of hope uh, to them, Lord. We're thankful as we are studying chapter 9, we can feel secure the promises of chapter 8 and, and that you've shown mercy to us. And uh, as Paul continues here, we pray that uh, his words, though directed maybe for different hearers in the first century, would still be uh, tremendously effective in causing us to appreciate more our salvation and uh, what it is that you've done for us on the cross. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, chapter 9 began with uh, Paul basically trying to make a case for the fact that uh, God's plan has not failed. God's plan was to bring a Jewish Messiah to the Jewish people, uh, and, uh, and the Jewish Messiah shows up and then is rejected by the Jewish people. So uh, what, happens, what happens now? Paul's uh, point, of course, is God the Father was uh, in heaven not going, uh-oh, what do we do now? In fact, He's going to show through prophecy, through scripture, through prophecies in the Old Testament, uh, that this was God's plan all along. Now, remember in chapter 9, he begins with his own passion uh, for, for the Jewish people. Uh, as he says, if I could, not that I could, but if I could, I would change, exchange my own salvation if the Jewish people could be saved. And then he goes on and talks about all of their privileges that they had in terms of having the Torah, having the law, having, having a, an economy under which they are able to worship God and so forth, uh, but then the tragedy of the rejection of the Messiah him, uh, himself. Then he gets into this whole issue that really continues for the last chapter that we've been on for a while, this idea of has God's uh, plan failed. And he's, he begins by saying, no, it really hasn't failed because we've really misunderstood the plan. In fact, uh, God is going to save who God is going to save. God's going to show mercy on whom he's going to show mercy. And he gave examples he chose, uh, basically, uh, Isaac instead of Ishmael. He chose Jacob instead of Esau. He, sh he chose Moses and not Pharaoh. And he goes through all these examples, the examples that we looked at uh, last week. And, uh, and again, we'd say, well, then, therefore, is God unrighteous in doing this? That's one of Paul's rhetorical questions. And he says, no, he's not. In fact, God is God. He can show mercy on whom he wants to show mercy. It's like a potter in clay. The clay can't talk back to the potter and tell him how to shape me, how to mold me, and whether you would make me in a noble pur purpose or ignoble. No, the clay can't talk back to uh, the master, and it's no different than our lives as well. As much as we appreciate the fact that when someone says to us, which they might this week, how do you know that you're really a Christian? How do you know that you're really saved? Our typical response would be something like, well, I know because I gave my life to Jesus Christ. I prayed and asked Jesus to forgive me of my sins. I accepted his death and his resurrection on, uh, on the cross uh, for, for my forgiveness. I know that I have a relationship with him. Uh, and that would be a good answer. You could even quote a couple of scriptures, Romans 10, uh, 9 and 10, or maybe a few others. Even John 3, 16. And I'm a whosoever. I've believed in him and I have eternal life. But Paul's focus, as we saw last week, is that one answer could be said as well, very short. How do you know you're saved? Because God showed me mercy, and that's it. I wasn't deserving it. None, none of those guys. Isaac wasn't deserving it. Jacob wasn't deserving it. Moses wasn't deserving it. God just showed his mercy on them. And his whole point is we get to this portion of Scripture. He's going to now, as I said, quote prophetic passages. He's going to deal with couple of things that Hosea said and a couple of things that uh, Isaac said to make a point that, in fact, not only has God's plan not failed, actually this was God's plan. His plan was to, at the rejection of the nation of Israel, to save individuals out of it. He's going to give us an example and an illustration of that. And not only that, he, on top of that, he's going to save, he's going to save the Gentiles. 
He's going to save people that were not his people previously. Only two groups of people in the Bible. There's only one race, the human race, and there's two groups, either Jewish or non-Jewish. Your Gentile sometimes translated the word Greek. And his, it was his plan all along uh, to save Gentiles as well. So let's take a look at this in verse 25. We're going to see that prophecy is applied to show that it was God's plan to save Gentiles. As he says also in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people, and her beloved who was not my beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people. There they shall be called the sons of the living God. So a couple things about this. And the first is that in the future, he says, Hey, Hosea even spelled it out. Gentiles would be called his people. In chapter 2, he kind of asked the question, who really is a Jew? He asked it again in chapter 4. And basically, he says, uh, it's, the, it's really the person who's come to faith in the Messiah. And you can't get saved by your behavior, the stuff you do. And you can't get saved by your birth, your physical uh, uh, lineage through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. No, it's such, so much more than that. And God is actually going to save a people that once were not his people, they're going to now be called uh, the children of God. In John 1.10, John, the, uh, the apostle writing there about Jesus, said that he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him, but as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become the children of God to those who believe in his name. It's the ones that come to him. He came to his own, to the Jewish people, and they did not know him. They rejected him. But he still came and gave the right to become children of God to those who what? Who believe uh, in his name. Here when he's quoting Hosea, and Paul, you know, the assumption, again, he's writing to a Jewish crowd primarily, going to turn to the Gentiles to begin to talk to them in chapter 11, primarily a Jewish crowd who would have known the Old Testament, we call it the Old Testament, forwards and backwards. So he can just allude to these passages with the assumption that they know exactly what he's talking about. We don't always know exactly what he's talking about. How many of you have been memorizing Hosea this week, doing a thorough study? See, not too much. So, so we actually need to go back and go, okay, can you kind of run that by me again, this little quote in Hosea? What was saying before it? What was saying after it? What's the historical context? So that's kind of what we knew, need to do, why we need to do it. So... If you want to turn to Hosea, you can do it. Otherwise, I've got these verses for you on the screen. But again, the, the background in Hosea is interesting. The, uh, we've got a, a divided kingdom, 10 tribes in the north, two in the south. <clears throat> and um, remember, they divided over tax, this thing called taxes, <laughs> and they, they split. But the kingdoms in the north, the king up there in rebellion against God were afraid that uh, the people in the north as they went back to Jerusalem to worship three times a year, that somehow he would lose favor, lose power. So he devises a scheme. He'll build a couple of his own temples. He devises his own kind of quasi-Judaism and mix it in with uh, uh, some of the other religions around. So they've got calf worship going on in the north and in the south. Uh, and this whole thing becomes so corrupted. And through a marriage of someone else, a woman called Jezebel, uh, they end up bringing child sacrifice uh, worship uh, into that kingdom, and things have gotten very bad uh, in the northern kingdom. God is about ready to judge them. He's been warning. We're going to see Jose. I mean, Isaiah has been warning for a long time. Jose is the guy on the scene uh, here at this uh, particular juncture, and God is saying that I'm going to judge you uh, because of this horrible sin and these terrible things you've been doing. I'm going to do it through the Assyrians. They're going to come in and they're going to wipe you out. In fact, that happened 722 uh, BC. So he sends Hosea. <laughs> kind of an interesting uh, uh, job to be a prophet in the Old Testament. You never know what God might ask you to do. And he asked Hosea to do something very interesting, as you recall the story. He says, because the people have committed such spiritual adultery and turning away from me, I want you, Hosea, to go and marry a prostitute and then allow her to have three kids or, or more because of her prostitution. But... You have to be completely faithful to her because you're going to represent me and she is going to rep represent the people. Tough job. And, uh, but Hosea does it. Uh, and uh, here's kind of the beginning, chapter 1, verse 2. When the Lord began to speak to Hosea, 
uh, the Lord said to Hosea, Go take yourself a wife of harlotry and, ch uh, and children of harlotry, for the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of uh, Debalaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. Then the Lord said to him, Call his name Jezreel, for in a little while I will avenge the bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Jehu, or Yehu, and bring an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. It shall come to pass in that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. So King Jehu was a as they all were, a very terrible king there in the north. And there had been some innocent bloodshed in that valley. And God says, I'm going to deal with and avenge. So marry her, marry the prostitute. When she has a kid now, in, because of her prostitution, you give him the name Jezreel. So that's uh, child number one. Verse six, we get to number two, which uh, gets into the text of our uh, Paul's quote here. Verse six, and she conceived again and bore a daughter. Then God said to him, uh, go, uh, go uh, call her Lo Ruhamah, for I will no longer have mercy on the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. I will have mercy on the house of Judah in the south there, and will save them by the Lord their God, and, and will not save them by the bow, nor uh, by sword or battle, by horses or horsemen. So uh, God is saying, okay, you got a second child. She's a gal. So you name her Lo Ruhama. So the Lo is no. And so the uh, Ru Lo Hama is mercy. No mercy. You know, how are we saved? God's mercy. What's God saying to these guys? No mercy. You've gone so far. You've done so much. You've rejected me. And therefore, you're going to be dealt with as a result. That becomes a very good example, of course, because our issue is, has God's plan failed because the nation rejected him and rejected the Messiah? Well, his point here is that he can show mercy on who he chooses to show mercy. Is he still showing mercy to some? Yeah, Judah. He's not judging them yet. He is showing them mercy. Not only that, we know from Scripture that there were righteous people of these ten tribes living up there. They see the calf worship. They see these horrible atrocities going on. They flee. And they go down to the south where they can go to the temple and have a, a relationship with God and so forth. So God is able to judge the nation because they rejected him. But he's able to still show mercy to individuals who he wants to. And, God, and Paul is saying that was God's plan all along. Yes, the nation rejected the Messiah, Jesus. But God is still showing mercy who he chooses to show mercy. Lo ruhama. Well, there's a third child that comes to play here. Verse 8. Now, when she was weaned, lo Ruhamah said uh, she conceived and uh, bore a son. Then God said, call his name lo Ami, Ami people, no people or not my people. For you are not my people and I will not be your God. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people. There shall be said of them, you are sons of the living God. That's our quote. There's these people in the future that are not Jewish, <laughs> and they're going to become sons of the living God. That's why Paul's quoting this. Then the children of Judah, verse 11, the children of Israel shall be gathered together and appoint for themselves one head, and they shall come up out of the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel. So uh, it is from the name, the third child, Lo-Ami, uh, that God is saying about the ten northern tribes, uh, even though you rejected me as a nation, I can still show mercy to individuals, and I can actually gather to me a people that previously did not know me and become my people. Becomes a pretty good example. That's a great quote, isn't it? That's exactly what's happened. Now, did that happen in that historical context? Yes, it did. Hosea prophesied it, and then the northern kingdom came in, and they were taken off and taken into captivity. The people of Judah, the individuals that went down to that southern kingdom, they were all spared. It all happened. Paul says, yes, it happened there. It was prophetic, a near fulfillment of that prophecy. But it applies right now in our day as well, because that's what happened. Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, came. The corrupt leadership in Jerusalem reject him. But I still save and am saving individuals out of that nation. And not only that, I'm going to save a whole group of people that were not, not before, not my people, the Gentiles. And they're going to become my people 
they're going to become uh, the sons of the living God. So it's, it's a great example. Now, one of the reasons that Paul, Paul goes to this is, you know, the whole, again, our, his whole point in chapter 9 is to help us, you and I, grab a hold of the fact that God's promises are true uh, because this becomes an issue. In other words, if God has, his promises are not true to the Jewish people of the nation of Israel because they rejected him and God's broken his promises to them, can we really trust the promises of chapter 8, which are the, there's no condemnation and nothing can separate us from the love of God and a lot of great stuff in between. And he's saying, you can't, because God's promises are true. Nothing's been broken. This is actually his plan all along, and he's using scripture. He's using examples of Old Testament figures to prove it. Now he's using prophecy as well. And he picks Hosea uh, for a very particular reason, something familiar to all Jewish people and Jewish people today, because Hosea is, comes to mind at every Jewish wedding. And the passage that comes to mind is chapter 2, verse 19. And this, this is... Uh, this is awesome. It's uh, verse 19 kind of help us to understand this whole issue of can we be secure in our relationship with God? That's his point of chapter 8. So watch this. Uh, again, Paul would be familiar with this. Uh, he would, it would come to mind of every Jewish person reading Hosea. They see it all the time in a wedding. I'll read it and then explain it. There in chapter 2, verse 19, and I've got it underlined three times, I will betroth you. Who? These people that have come. Come to him and received his mercy. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, in loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. Here's how it happens at a wedding. Jewish couple are getting married. Uh, they come up front, and they stand under a, a little canopy called the hoopah. And, uh, and we've actually got to see it a few times because uh, Pastor Bud, Mary Karen, was uh, Israeli. Uh, and so they asked Kathy to make the hoopah that they would stand under. It's just kind of a lacy kind of a canopy, and there's four poles. And so there's four guys, the groomsmen, in a sense, standing around and hold it, and, and they're under. And, uh, and then it got reused again for Danny Lehman's uh, son. I don't forget if it was David or Daniel, but one of them married a, a Jewish gal as well. Uh, and uh, so they're under the hoopah. But at a, uh, at a Jewish wedding, what happens is they're under there. They're about ready to exchange their vows. And then the groom will walk out of the hoopah and walk around it. One, two, three times and go back in. And a lot of people are going, well, why do you do that? Tradition. But actually, if you're there the next time you see a wedding, you can go, Hosea, chapter 2, verse 19. That's God's promise to anybody that will come to him in mercy. He will say to them, I betroth you. And uh, you will be with me forever in righteousness and justice. It's based on my loving kindness and his mercy. It's based on my faithfulness. I promise it. I promise it. I promise it. Nothing can separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. It's all on his mercy. That's, that's the intent. That's what Paul's point is, uh, is here. It's not just tradition. It's to remind us of God's faithfulness and the security that we have in our relationship uh, with, with him. Again, that's the point of, of chapter 8. And uh, it's the explanation as why churches are filled with Gentiles today. <laughs> when I first became a Christian, I didn't really understand. I didn't understand that. I couldn't figure out why the church wasn't mostly Jewish and there was a couple of Gentiles thrown in. I, that would kind of, if you read, just read the Gospels, you read the Bible, you know, uh, and you read the Gospels and the book of Acts, that, that would just seem the way it would be, right? This whole thing is a Jewish deal. It's a Jewish book and a Jewish Messiah and the whole thing. Uh, it's a Jewish kingdom that's coming in the future. Uh, it's pretty cool. They let a couple of Gentiles in is what I was thinking. You know, I didn't know a lot. I'm just saying a thing in that. And, uh, but this is it. This is the explanation. Because the nation rejected the Messiah. That was God's plan. He knew that it was going to happen. But in his mercy, he, chose in, he saves individual out of it. In the past, in a historical context, before the Assyrian destruction. He's, Paul's saying he does it in his day. He's doing it in our day as well. But not only that, he's actually now made a people that were not his people, now his people. And he says to them, to all of us that have come to him in mercy, that he calls us his sons of the living God, I betroth you three times. And it's all going to be predicated or based on my faithfulness uh, to you. So how are we doing so far? Prophecy is applied to show that it was God's plan to save Gentiles. Prophecy indicated that only a small number of Jews would be saved to start with. Look at verse 27 to 29 
here's where we get our quotes from Isaiah. Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, that's, can't even count them, the remnant, that's only a small portion, the remnant will be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. As Isaiah said before, here's another quote from another passage. Unless the Lord of Shapaoth had left us a seed, we would, would have become like Sodom. We would have been made like Gomorrah. So Paul is saying that uh, God's plan is intact. It was his uh, plan all along. Uh, that uh, he would show mercy to whom he shows mercy, and it would be individuals, and it wouldn't be the large group. Uh, it wouldn't be the whole nation that gets saved initially. It would just be a, a, a remnant. We're still on track. We're still okay. This is what Isaiah predicted uh, all along. Though the children of Israel, verse 27, they're like the sand of the sea. I mean, there's a lot, but the promise is only a portion, a remnant, are going to be saved, and that was what was happening in Paul's day. Of course, the remnant is something we've talked a lot about in terms of prophecy. It becomes very important to us because it's a remnant of Jewish believers in the future during the seven-year tribulation period that at the end, as God has supernaturally protected them in Petra, in, uh, in southern Jordan, he uh, supernaturally protects them. They cry out as a nation, as a group, finally... Jesus said, you won't see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, until you recognize me as the Messiah nationally. Is it going to be everyone? Paul's going to say in Romans 12, and all Israel be saved. Everyone? No, the remnant that's there. They cry out. They recognize he's the Messiah. He returns to planet Earth. So we talk about the remnant, the remnant of Jews. Paul's point is, he's always had a remnant. There's always been a remnant of believing Jews. Right from day one, the day of Pentecost, right in through all of church history. Something denied by, by a lot of uh, Protestant church writers and so forth, but uh, very, very well documented. God's always had uh, believing Jews that believe that Jesus is the Messiah from, from day one. So he says that prophecy indicates that only a small number called the remnant would be saved. He quotes Isaiah 10, 22, and 23. The promises uh, going to happen. It happened in that day. It happens in our day. It will happen in the future. Now, again, this is the historical context. It's still the Assyrian deal. Isaiah actually is, uh, is uh, further down. He's, uh, he's chronologically ahead of Hosea, prophesying this thing that's going to happen if the people don't repent. Uh, and in context, the quote is this, 11, 11, uh, it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left, just a group, from Assyria and Egypt, from Hathros and Cush, from Elam, from Sinar, from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. Uh, he will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcast of Israel and gather together dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Isaiah says, in the future, God is going to gather together a remnant from the four corners of the world again a remnant of people that are believing in the Messiah that he's uh, shown uh, mercy to. And, uh, and like I say, there's a lot said about the remnant uh, in the minor prophets in particular. And I could read a lot, but uh, I want to just go to one other passage in Zechariah 13.8. He speaks about the future remnant, what's going to happen. Kind of a little shocking deal, but it actually gives us the number of how many Jewish people will actually survive the tribulation period this time. Uh, still in the future, where we have a one world leader, sets up his government. Uh, we refer to him as the Antichrist. Uh, he basically uh, uh, rules for a seven year period. But this remnant that he's going to be specifying here is what brings Jesus back to planet earth to establish his kingdom. Zechariah 13 8, and it shall come to pass uh, in all the land, says the Lord, that two thirds of it shall be cut off and die, but one third shall be left in it. I will bring one third through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people. And each one, each one individually will say, this is my God. So only a third of the people, when we were going through some of these studies, we kind of gave you the numbers based on uh, population. 
of Jewish people worldwide right now. But keep in mind that during that period, the tribulation period, when God begins to pour out his wrath on a Christ-rejecting world, when God begins to deliver the judgment against this world because of all the horrific things that are happening to Christians today in the world. The most dangerous place to be a Christian in the world today is North Korea, but there are horrific things, and we're seeing some of them in Syria on the news. A pile of dead bodies piled together with a picture of Jesus on top of that dead pile. I don't know if you saw that or not. This is just a couple of days ago. That's a message. That's a message. These were Christians that were slaughtered and then their bodies were dragged into the streets and left there for the birds to peck their bodies apart. This is what's going on in the world today. And one of these days, Jesus Christ is going to deal with it. It's called the Great Tribulation Period, a period of great cataclysmic events. By the time we get to the end of the seven-year period, and God's poured out his wrath on this planet, two-thirds of the planet's population will be decimated and destroyed. Uh, again, our, our position is that church will be raptured from the planet before that begins. Uh, and that's, we are the restraining force of, uh, Paul talks about, that keeps the Antichrist from coming on the scene. And, uh, but God does that. So two-thirds of the general population is destroyed. Two-thirds of the Jewish population is destroyed as well. They're destroyed primarily because the Antichrist is scouring the planet to find them and kill them. But God is going to supernaturally protect a third of them, which will be millions of them, uh, and keep them safe because they are the remnant. Uh, and that's what Isaiah is talking about there. Secondly, the small number will be saved according to God's word. It needs a little explanation because of verse 28. Here where Paul's doing, and uh, he's quoting Isaiah. He says, this is what prophet Isaiah says. So if you, if you were to, in your uh, Bible software, if you were to cut and paste that, put it in your concordance, and do a search, you won't find it. The reason you won't find it is that he's taken a couple of portions of what Isaiah has said and just, and just thrown them together in the context to make his point. Isaiah said it, but it's not a direct quote from Isaiah. It's a portion of a couple of things that he said, so it needs a little explanation. And one of the things that, very interesting, uh, New King James usually gets it uh, pretty close, uh, but I'm not sure uh, here in verse 28 where it says, for he will finish the work. <laughs> That's not in the Greek. It's not the, it's not the Greek word for work. In fact, if you looked it up, transliterated it into English, you would even recognize the word. It's the word logos. The word logos means what? It means a word, right? And, uh, but so I, it's kind of baffling why they chose work here. But the idea for he will finish in the future, he will finish his word, his revelation. It's going to come to pass. His promises are true. He will cut it short in righteousness. It's going to come quickly. This uh, judgment he's talking about here because the Lord is master upon the earth. Uh, just to give you a couple of other uh, translations, even the uh, American Standard Version, which tries to go one Greek word for every English word, says, for the Lord will execute his word upon the earth, finishing it and cutting it short. This is one time when the NIV, I think, has the better translation where it says the Lord will carry out his sentence on earth with speed and finality. Paul says God's plan is going to happen. It may seem like it. You may question the fact that the whole nation has rejected the Messiah and what in the world happened there. Paul said, I hate to tell you this, but that was God's plan all along. In fact, Hosea says it is. Isaiah says that it is, but he's still showing mercy on individuals. He's still going to show mercy on individuals in the future, uh, and he's still saving not only Jewish people that he's showing mercy on, but he's saving a whole group of people of Gentiles that uh, never even thought about religion or, or Judaism or knowing God or the one true God or, uh, or anything else. Isaiah 10.22 again refers to the last half of Paul's verse. Uh, for though your people, O Israel, be as the sand of the sea, a remnant of them will return. The destruction decree shall overflow with righteousness. So God, uh, he's saying that um, God planned it all. It was all prophesied by Isaiah and Hosea. And then thirdly, the small number will be saved by the Lord himself. Second half of the verse. Unless the Lord of Shabaoth, so it's not Sabbath, it's Shabaoth, has left us a seed 
uh, we would have become like Sodom. We would have become like Gomorrah. Unless, uh, and the, the Lord's Shabbat means the God of the armies. If, if God wasn't the God of the armies of heaven, that we'd be toast, right? I mean, that's, we kind of get Sodom and Gomorrah. We kind of got the picture of, uh, of what happened there. Uh, Paul is saying that if God hadn't protected us and shown us his mercy, we'd all be in big, big trouble. It's only because of his mercy uh, that we've been saved. Now, that, that little quote comes from uh, Isaiah 1.9, where he says, unless the Lord of hosts, Shabbat, same word, had left us a very small remnant, we would have become like Sodom, we would become like Gomorrah. So uh, how did things go there in Genesis 19? Well, we know the whole story uh, and what was going on, but uh, just to read Genesis 19.24 to help make Paul's point, he says, then the Lord rained down brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah, from the Lord out of the heavens, he overthrew the cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the city, and what grew on the ground. I'd say there's, there's nothing left. If there's not even a plant on the ground, we'd say total destruction. Paul is saying, you remember what Isaiah said, unless in his mercy he chose a remnant, a seed, unless he was not the, guard of our, uh, the God of armies that protected us, we'd all, we'd all been, we'd have been toast. We'd have all been wiped out. It's only because of, of his mercy. But you remember there was a remnant that was saved. There was a few people that were saved, right? That's why the point of his illustration. Remember how this happened? But remember how God went in because he knows how to deliver, Peter would say in Second Peter. And we know that it's uh, Lot and his family, Second Peter 2.6. If we didn't have this, I'm not sure I would say that Lot was a righteous man. Uh, I don't know if you're with me on that, but you read that passage in Genesis and it's just like, I don't know what's up with that guy, you know, and uh, don't want to even go into the details of the story, but uh, it doesn't seem like a real righteous guy, but uh, Peter says he is. But notice here, Peter saying, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly and deliver righteous lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for this day. Who did he spare? A very small remnant. God, God brought judgment, but there was a very small remnant that was saved. Is God's plan uh, fully intact? Yes, it is, because God knows how to save a remnant. The nation might have rejected us just like they did before they were conquered by the Assyrians, but God knew how to save a remnant. Uh, God knows how to save a remnant. Well, look at Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, that was as bad as we could get. If God wasn't the God of armies and able to do this, if God didn't show mercy on Lot, we all agree that Lot got, got out of there by mercy. Even when the angels were taking him, remember, they, we talked about this in detail. They physically got him by the arms and pulled him out is the idea. I mean, they were reluctant all the way. I would say that was mercy. Remember, the daughters go with him. We kind of have this misconception of, uh, of Lot's wife as though they're, they're hightailing it out of town as the fire and brimstone are coming. She kind of glances over her shoulder. It turns into a pillar of salt. That's not it at all. Remember, we said she turned and looked longingly towards, and she wouldn't leave. And so she's destroyed with, with the rest. But God, even under the most extreme example of judgment we could think of, God still knew how to save a remnant out of there. That's Paul's point. Do you see God's plan? That's what he's saying. God's plan hasn't failed. It was actually uh, prophesied. The nation of Israel rejected his will. It did not defeat his purpose. In fact, it fulfilled his purpose because it brought about the preaching of the gospel to Gentiles, a people that were not his, uh, his uh, people at one time that are uh, now his people. So prophecy is applied to show that it was God's plan to save Gentiles. Uh, it was predicated on the rejection uh, of the Messiah by the nation. And uh, Paul says, but that was still part of his plan. Listen to what Hosea says. Prophecy has indicated that in reality, only a small number of the Jews would be saved, a remnant that happened then. It's happening today. It becomes a critical point of the fulfillment of prophecy and bringing Jesus back to planet Earth in the future. Uh, and then three, Israel stumbled because they didn't seek a righteousness that is by faith, and that's in verse 30 to 33. What then, <clears throat> what shall we say then? 
that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, have not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. So here's the, and what shall we say then? Rhetorical question that he has about three of in this passage. And the first thing is that Gentiles received a salvation they weren't pursuing, which probably really bothered Jewish people. You know, again, we tried to, you know, give this illustration. If you're oh, waiting in a very long line, <clears throat> like in an airport, a customs thing, and there's hundreds of people, and you've been waiting in line for two hours plus, I've actually experienced, I'm drawing from experience. Oh, and then you're finally nearing the front of this thing. And, um, and then all of a sudden you have a rush of people that jump ahead of you. You're not real uh, godly and excited, you know, about that, right, right at, at the moment. And uh, mentioned the first, I don't know why, when I get real upset, that's when the pigeon comes out. And it's probably good because people in places like China and on the mainland have no idea what I'm saying. And that's better. That's probably better at that point. It's nothing flattering, I can, I can tell you. Uh, that's, that's the Jewish perspective. You know, the Gentiles who are not even pursuing, they're not doing anything. Never been circumcised. They've never gone to the temple. They don't even know what the Torah is. They have no idea what the Shabbat is. They don't do anything. They don't do anything. And all of a sudden, you're telling me they're righteous? No, see, the Jewish belie even the Jewish believers are going, no way. Get at We've been in line for 2,000 years. That's a very long time. I would like you to get at the end of the line behind us do all the stuff we had to do. And when you get to the front of the line, God bless you if you're made righteous, but you get in line behind us. Jewish perspective. The church's perspective in the first century. That's why we have Acts 15. Big council. What do we do here? You know, Paul's out, you know, preaching the gospel of these Gentiles. They're getting saved. You know, Peter, Peter's, you know, he's not big on this whole thing, but uh, he takes a short-term missions trip. He goes up to Samaria, you know, where Stephen, and he goes, man, they're getting saved. Samaritans can't figure this out you know so he comes back and then and then he goes over uh, to uh, uh, to the coast area to the Mediterranean he stays at uh, uh, Simon the uh, the Tanner's house which was like most Jewish boys would not do that because what does a Tanner do he treats handles dead bodies that means he's unclean he, okay so I either Peter surfed and that was a good break right there or God's really changing his heart one of the two but he's he's okay staying there which is very unusual and then he gets the whole vision Go up and see this Roman centurion. Yeah, right. You know, he gives them the vision of the, uh, the animals clean and unclean. It's not about dietary laws or eating. He's still, he's still kosher. It's just about whether he'd walk into the guy's house or not to preach the gospel. You know, of course he does. So Peter jumps in the middle of Acts 15 and goes, uh, I'm sure I'm glad I took a couple witnesses with me because this is what's happened. That's why he took them. Because uh, he didn't want to go, well, this happened to me. Yeah, you and who else? No, I got a couple witnesses here. And they go through this whole thing. If they, don't, if they don't settle that right then, you're calling me rabbi and all your kids are getting circumcised on the eighth day as Christians. This is the, the issue. But they settle it and they go, nah, let the Gentiles be Gentiles. Tell them to remember the poor. Don't do stuff to stumble our faith. And, uh, you know, we're just going to go on from God. Apparently this was his plan all along. It was a big issue. So Paul's point here is that <laughs> the Gentiles, they're just kind of, we're just going to walk into the deal. We're not even pursuing a righteousness. We just hear the gospel and go, man, that sounds good to me. Let's get saved. And they're like, tradition, you got to do something. But it was a, it was a big issue. And it was a, still an issue when Paul is writing this. It's still, in, you know, it's, it's still, it was an issue in the church for, for quite a while. But uh, uh, Paul's whole thing is that in God's sovereignty, uh, he's going to show mercy to who he shows mercy and now he brings in this idea of human responsibility uh, in it as well. Uh, they were saved even though they weren't pursuing it. Israel was not saved even though they were pursuing it. We could say they rejected grace righteousness, trying to please God with law righteousness. And this is all Paul's whole point in the letter, all right, that we're saved by grace alone. Uh, Romans 1.16, he kind of begins... I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. First uh, to the Jew first, also to the Greek or the Gentile for in it, 
The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So a pursuit of righteousness doesn't guarantee you having it. Again, we said you, you don't, are not made righteous by birth or by behavior. It's, it's, by, it's by faith and it's by God's mercy. Uh, James says it doesn't help you if you even keep the whole law. Whoever shall keep the whole law yet stumble at just one point, he's guilty of all of it. We all need to be saved by grace. Uh, no matter who we are, we can't attain it by seeking it through good works. Verse 32, why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. What's the at that? What's the stumbling stone? It's, it's being saved by God's mercy. It's being saved by God's grace. It's like they're headed down H3. Sometimes we call it the Hawaiian Autobahn at about 75 miles an hour. Uh, unless you're a Marine on a motorcycle, then you're doing 105. And, uh, you know, and all of a sudden there's a big stone in the, in the middle of the freeway. If you don't know it's coming and you don't see it, you're, you're in big trouble. You're going to run right into it. That's his whole point. He's saying, you guys, there's, there's a lot of Jewish people as a nation that just ran into it, didn't even recognize what it was because it was Jesus. That's what Paul says later in his letter to the uh, Corinthian church. He says, for Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, a stumbling block. What was the stumbling block? Christ crucified. And to the Greeks, foolishness. But to, to those who were called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. The stumbling block as a person is Jesus Christ and him crucified. The third, he says, Israel stumbled over the rock of offense. There again, quoting Isaiah, verse 33. Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense. And whoever, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Emphasizing again, not only human, uh, uh, human responsibility, uh, but God's sovereignty. Uh, what is it? Whoever. There's another whoever. Whoever believes in him. I thought it was God's sovereignty showing mercy. It is. But it's also whoever. Whoever would believe on him. Anybody that would believe on him would not be put to shame. His final quote there is uh, Isaiah 28, 16. And uh, this is not the only place in the Old Testament that refers to uh, Jesus, the coming Messiah, the person uh, that would uh, be the stone of offense. Uh, or else he would be the, uh, the stone that would break us and humble us and, and we'd come to know him personally. Uh, the psalmist uh, writes in Psalm 118, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. That's really the issue. That's the problem. It's a problem with a lot of people today, isn't it? This idea that you can be saved by faith alone. There's a lot of, not just Jewish people, there's a lot of Roman Catholics. There's a lot of Baptists. There's a lot of Protestants. There's a lot of Meptobacterian, whatever you got, that still think you've got to do stuff to get saved. And Paul's saying it's by faith alone. God just shows mercy. We just accept what God's done for us. Everything we do after that, as we were looking at yesterday morning, is just our response because God loved us and saved us and showed us his mercy. Uh, then it gets to be, well, man, what, what, is there anything I can do? you know, to, to serve their Lord, to walk with the Lord, to be his ambassador. Five things about the stone. I'm just going to mention them very quickly. Uh, and then I have this cool passage. I, I just got to read to you from, uh, from Peter. But the stone is established by God. Notice it says, I lay in Zion. This is God's doing. The stone element is eliminated by religious leaders. First uh, Peter 2, 6 says, therefore, it is also contained in the scripture here he quotes that passage again. Behold, I lay in Zion, a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. And he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. The, the, they stumble being disobedient to the word to which they were also uh, were appointed. It's like they, they were corrupt. God knew they were going to be corrupt. They were actually appointed to this. And it was so the gospel could actually go to the whole world. Uh, but again, just to show you that Peter and Paul, both of these uh, good Jewish boys, rabbis, are on the same page in all this. 
Watch what happens after this. Now, we have this little quotation that we're familiar with, this whole chosen generation, royal priesthood, and all that stuff. Love to hear that. I really don't think it has anything to do with us because I think let, Peter's letter is, I'd say, messianic. There's people that disagree with me on that, uh, but, uh, and that's okay. But it starts in the beginning. He's writing to uh, the tribes that are dispersed. Uh, that doesn't sound like a bunch of Gentiles to me. Gentiles are never referred to as a holy nation. We're the bride, the bride of Christ and so forth. Jewish context, you'll see it here in a minute, verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, who were once, oh, there it is, who were once lo ami, but now you are the people of God, who had at one time were lo ruhamah, but now you have attained mercy. Wow, where did Peter get that? He's quoting Hosea. Same passage that, uh, that Paul is quoting here in Romans 9. You were once not a people, but now you're the people of God. You were once not shown mercy, but now you're shown mercy. Why? Because you didn't stumble over the rock of offense. You accepted what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross. You accepted God's mercy for your life. Because of that, you're now a royal priest at a holy nation. His very own uh, people meant to declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into light. Well, certainly we can say a lot of that is true of all believers, but just to show you that Peter and Paul are on the, on the same page here. We can be so thankful that we have this understanding. Again, God's plan hasn't failed. Not, in fact, we're saying, man, this is exactly what he, what he planned. We see it in the examples he gave of the people, the mercies that he's shown, as well as the prophecies that he has brought up. The stone is exalted. We see that it's a chief cornerstone. Uh, and very importantly for the stone is explained to be a person. Notice it's, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. The stone is a person. It's Jesus Christ. And the stone exists as a kingdom forever. Because in Daniel chapter 2, when he lists the dream of Nebuchadnezzar and all of the kingdoms of the world, in the end, there is a stone that smashes all of those world kingdoms, and it is established as a kingdom forever and ever, and that's Jesus Christ uh, in his, his kingdom. Again, God doesn't save us because of birth or behavior. It's by grace alone. And the main point is clear here. Israel's rejection of Christ doesn't deny God's faithfulness. Uh, in fact, Romans 9 doesn't negate Romans 8. It just shows us that God is faithful, he's righteous, he's just. And we can depend on the promises of, of Romans, Romans 8. And I love that, you know, the, why is Paul doing this? He wants to make sure that you and I, these guys, but you and I, as we study this together, that we really are secure in our relationship with Jesus Christ. We're saved because of the mercy of God, because we didn't stumble over the rock of offense thinking that we could earn our own salvation. We can accept what he's done for us. His promises are true. There's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus, and nothing can separate us from the love of God. And the next time you're at a Jewish wedding, and you see that guy, that groom, walk around the hoopah three times, you can say, you know why he's doing that? Hosea 2.19. God is faithful. He's saying three times, I betroth you forever, forever, forever. And I hate to tell you about that, but that includes me. Because I was one of those people who were not the people of God, and now I am the people of God, as prophesied by Isaiah and Hosea. And he's going to say, well, how did that happen? Well, we're not there yet, but Paul's going to say it's because we got grafted in. The point is, God's not done with his people. He's saving them individually in terms of the Jewish people, but he's not done with them yet, as 85% of the people in the church today would say. He's not done with them yet. Not understanding Romans 9, 10, and 11, if the church had studied this through the centuries, it'd be a lot easier to share the gospel with Jewish people today, I can tell you that. But because of the persecution and the terrible things that have been done in the name of Christ, because people didn't study this, and they thought that the promises to Israel were now for the church, there's been horrible things done, and it makes it tough. Does it make it impossible? No, because God's still calling individuals. He's still showing mercy to individuals. We may not save the whole nation of Israel, but we can sure be a witness to them and everybody else that Jesus Christ is the stumbling stone, but we don't have to stumble over him. We can recognize that he's our savior and by mercy we can be saved. Amen. Well, let's pray.
like you, Lord of heaven, King of glory. 